Hello friends, welcome to another segment of my series on the cholinergic system. This uh, episode will be covering uh, the history of studies involving nicotine's role in cognition. Note that below under the video in the description I have a link to a blog post that is meant to accompany this video with the extensive citations. So to begin, we will recall that there are two uh, seg uh, sorts of cholinergic receptors in the brain. I mean, these also exist in the nervous system, but we're only talking about the brain in this series. So one, both of them respond to the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, but one group, which we already covered, responds also to the uh, mushroom toxin um, muscarine. So they are called muscarinic cholinergic receptors. The other sort uh, respond in addition to acetylcholine to nicotine which is a chemical found in the nightshade uh, family of plants. Studies on how nicotine affects cognition began with animals in the 1960s and 70s. By the 1990s, it was clear that nicotine had tremendous effects on neurotransmitters in the brain, including the monoamine neurotransmitters that are very well known, through its effect on nicotinic cholinergic receptors, indicating the profound effect of agonizing nicotinic cholinergic receptors. So specifically, it was found that uh, dopamine, extracellular dopamine was increased in the hippocampus, frontal cortex, cingulate cortex, and pontine nucleus, as well as serotonin was increased in the frontal cortex, cingulate gyrus, and norepinephrine was increased in the substantia nigra, in the cingulate uh, gyrus, as well as in the pontine nucleus. So three uh, monoamine uh, neurotransmitters, dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine were seen to increase in quantity in areas of the brain through the stimulation of nicotine in rodents. By the 1970s, it was known that nicotine had a neuroprotective effect on the dopaminergic neurons of the brain. Those are the neurons that have dopamine receptors in them, and also the neurons that die out and cause Parkinson's disease. How this was discovered was that, through epi epidemiological studies, it was known that uh, smokers develop Parkinson's disease much less frequently than non-smokers. Eventually, it was discovered that nicotine itself has a neuroprotective effect on dopaminergic neurons through its agoni agonizing of the nicotinic cholinergic receptors in the brain. Uh, by the 1980s, um, studies began on Alzheimer's disease and how nicotine could affect cognition in Alzheimer's disease. These studies and further studies broadly showed that nicotine has effects on uh, attention and memory that are very significant. Particularly, it improves cognition in attention, sustained attention-driven tasks, which makes sense because of our understanding of the cholinergic system's role in attention, uh, which is, I believe, the primary uh, benefit to manipulating the cholinergic system in the brain. Now, the studies on nicotine have shown two interesting outcomes. One is that nicotine improves cognitive function in a U-shaped curve, where too little nicotine is not good for cognitive function and too much nicotine is not good for cognitive function. There is a happy middle ground. Second, and surprisingly, and this, ties in, this, this, this was sort of indi uh, indicated earlier in my, or <laughs> I combined hint and indicated, indicated, it was indicated in my earlier episodes that nicotine actually causes an upregulation of nicotinic cholinergic receptors. Because of this upregulation, up chronic administration of nicotine does not decrease the substantial effect that's shown on cognition. It, it, originally, it was thought that just acute effects of nicotine were helpful for cognition, but it turns out that chronic use will still improve cognition, which is a wonderful news. A final thing I'd like to mention about nicotine as a chemical, its effect on the brain, and by the way, when we talk about nicotine, you have to understand something. We're talking about all 17 nicotinic cholinergic receptors because nicotine affects all of them, although it does not so, do so equally throughout the receptors. But back to what I was saying, there are things called mode networks of the brain. Mode networks are um, activity in the brain that is shown on fMRI scans that shows an interconnectivity uh, or an in interconnectedness between different parts of the brain that work together in certain modes. So this is quite uh, relevant to depression and to ADHD, uh, as well as other mental illnesses. So the default mode network 
is the network that is uh, task negative. That means when you are not doing an externally driven task, like when you're not um, responding to someone's call or something like that, when you are sitting sort of quietly or doing something that does not requ require sustained externally driven attention, the default mode network of the brain, which is called the DMN, uh, activates. You can think of the default mode network as your stream of consciousness. Specifically, it's the network that um, mindfulness meditators try to quiet. It's that uh, network that is active when you're doing something like washing the dishes or cleaning your car, when you're thinking about something in the back of your brain. Now, unfortunately, in uh, depressed people and, uh, well, let's leave ADHD people aside because it's a little bit more complicated, but it, for example, in depressed people, the default mode network is overactive. And what le this leads to is rumination over uh, topics that do, do not uh, influence the depressed people very well. For example, they may ruminate over past mistakes or um, traumatic events in their lives and so on. So mindfulness meditation is a, is a tool that people use to try to weaken the control of the default mode network over the brain in periods where you're not having externally driven sustained attention. Another network is the central executive network, the CEM. The central executive network is the network that is involved when you are externally driven with your attention. So for example, when your teacher comes and asks you a question in an obvious way, your brain uses the salience network to switch from the uh, default mode network to the central executive network. So the default mode network and the central executive network are somewhat antagonistic to each other. What's been found very interestingly is that with the use of nicotine, the amount, the proportion of time that is spent on the default mode network is decreased as compared to the proportion of time that is spent on the central executive network. Meaning that nicotine may have uh, um, therapeutic effects on the depressed because it, it allows them to better access their central executive network. And people who have extreme rumination and extreme depression, even while being called towards some externally driven attention, for example, a teacher coming to you and ask a question, someone very depressed may still be in their thoughts and unable to focus on the, um, the uh, task at hand. And that is an overactivation of the default mode network. So nicotine dis uh, changes this and increases the power of the salience mode network and the predominance of the central executive network to switch away from the default mode network. So this was a brief review on nicotine's effects in the brain. In the next section, I will introduce you to the nicotinic cholinergic receptors. Thank you for watching and be sure to check out the blog post below. Have a great day.